Welcome to another episode of the Plutus Awards podcast. Our community is filled with hundreds of stories from creators and entrepreneurs just like you. And through this show, we share these stories of challenges and successes from bloggers to podcasters to writers, speakers, and more. Today's guest is Stephanie O'Connell, personal finance author, co-founder of Statement Event, and founder of Statement Cards. We talk about how Stephanie lost over six figures in projected revenue within two weeks at the height of COVID-19, how she felt about her work and her business, the pressure she felt, and how her perspective has changed when it comes to her worth around her work. Let's dive right into my conversation with Stephanie O'Connell. Stephanie, welcome to the Plutus Awards podcast. Very excited to have you on today. Well, I'm excited to be here. Excellent. So let's start off with what was your business like pre-COVID and what were some of the goals that you were hoping to reach this year or in 2020? Oh, thinking about January 2020, I was so full of hope. I was so full of expectations and positivity. (laughs) I guess at the time, I had really started making a shift in my business. I've been blogging about personal finance for seven, eight years. And I got to the point of wanting to expand what I was talking about and writing about. And I wanted to explore new platforms. I had already grown my business into speaking and video, but I was really more interested in creating community, amplifying other people's stories, other people's voices. I just found through my own experience that the more perspectives people hear, the better, higher value advice and community we build and and the more people we can serve. And so I had been really trying to shift my business in that direction the last few years, perhaps most notably in the statement community I created. It's a community for women in financial media, and we kind of connect the dots between gender equity and money and kind of bridging the gap between the economists and the behavioral psychologists and the writers and the journalists to make sure we're really serving people as best we can with as much information as possible. That was a branch of my business I had started. And then last year, right before the pandemic, I also launched a totally separate thing, which is a line of greeting cards focused on celebrating milestones like paying off student loans and getting a raise. So having a physical product had just kind of been a new thing I launched right before the pandemic. Great timing. I was really excited about those things. I was really excited to see my business evolving in a direction I felt excited about because I know we all need to write about credit sometimes, but writing about five ways to improve your credit score for the hundredth time was making me crazy. So I think I was very filled with optimism and, and excitement at the beginning of the year. And then when the pandemic hit, I I just lost like all of my business. My business model is really built on speaking and brand partnerships. So basically everything that I do is I'm I'm like a small media company. I'm like a small news site, right? If there's no advertising or sponsorship revenue coming in, like it that's the work that supports the journalism. That's the work that for me supported my event and my cards and like all these other risks I was taking and pivots I was making. And all of a sudden, like I had lost overnight, you know, over six figures in projected revenue because the marketing budgets were gone. And it was devastating in many ways. And my husband lost his job at the same time. So I kind of just spent the first three months, March, April, May, just kind of trying to figure out what we were going to do. Thankfully, we have emergency savings and all that. But, you know, I, as someone who has big ambitions and big dreams and, and loves running a business, I think not figuring out how to take the next steps toward those things was really disorienting. And yet, in the meantime, I like still had to figure out how to pay my rent and pay our grocery bill and all of that other stuff. But our savings could at least take care of that. I think what was really a big loss was just feeling like there was no sense of of clarity around how to move forward in that time in terms of like the big dreams and, and the ambitions, which is like a wonderfully privileged position to be in, but it was disorienting all the same. Right, exactly. Because if if you had all these contracts lined up and you're like, okay, well, this is what's going to happen, or I, I can say for certainty or most 
<laughs> most likely will happen. And then having all that taken away can be quite the uh, event, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, I'm just nodding because I'm reliving <laughs> it in my head. And I'm like, yep, yeah, it's been a ride. And I know that this is not a unique experience in any way. So I'm al I'm also very cognizant of the fact that like, I'm sitting here being like, oh, God, it was horrible. But everyone is going through it at the same time. So it's, it doesn't make it less horrible, but it kind of makes just me feel not alone, which is nice. Yeah. I mean, everyone's experience, whatever the specifics are, are valid, right? Yeah. I am curious, though, when you were informed that people were pulling back their marketing budgets, that either it was postponed or canceled, was it all at once that happened? Like, And if it was, what was your immediate reaction? Uh, I cried a lot. So it really all happened within about two weeks. And at first, I think there was a little bit of uncertainty. A lot of the idea was, oh, we're going to just delay a couple months. And this is true for my business. And also because this happened to me and my husband at the same time, it, that created an extra layer of urgency around it. His job at first was postponed for four weeks. And so at first, we were both like, oh, well everything is just pushed. We just need to figure out how to get through the next month. And then the next month became, we just need to figure out how to get through until summer. And then I think in June, it became clear that both of our income sources were not coming back anytime soon. More for my husband than me, he's a Broadway stagehand, which just announced their close through June, 2021. So and the timeline of that is just, you know, it, it would have been incomprehensible to me if you told me in January that that would have happened. And then also, then for me, there's an extra pressure on my business to really be generating revenue. And I think what for me started as a pushing the uh, benchmarks from, okay, I'm waiting a couple months to, oh, this is a lost cause <laughs> in terms of like the specific projects I had thought were going to happen. I started embracing kind of like a worst case scenario approach where like, let, let me assume there will be nothing till the end of the year. And that really just made me shift my life in a way that could accommodate that loss instead of putting that much pressure on my business. My husband and I moved out of New York City. We broke the lease on our apartment. And that just... That just gave us more breathing room because even though we have more than six months of emergency savings, the fact is like, I'm speaking to you now in October. This happened in March. This has been seven months. <laughs> no standard three to six month emergency fund could have really sheltered us from how severely this is affecting our household, my business, my husband's income, everything. Yeah, for sure. So I want to pivot a little bit to the mindset part because you've alluded to this quite a few times, obviously, in our conversation, but it was like, well, how do we grapple with this? How do we deal with the uncertainty? It felt like sort of the rug was pulled out under me. And so what were some of the questions or things that were going through your mind? Because it sounds like the practical stuff was together. Like you got your finances kind of in order, you figured all that. But again, what was it yeah. to experience that huge loss of income? Because six figures, pretty huge. And then sort of what were some of the things that you worked through? For me, the practical part is pretty easy. I, I have a thing that I think is really useful in that I, I feel things very much evenly left and right brain. <laughs> I, I can be very practical and analytical and make decisions from that place. Unfortunately, the right brain part of me is still very active. So even though I could understand it and do what I needed to do, it was extraordinarily painful and disorienting and depressing to go through the experience. And my partner, Emma, who I work on statement with said, you know, it's so hard to sit down every day at my computer and have an empty inbox. And I know like empty inbox is kind of the goal we generally talk about in productivity world, but to experience just like the total lack of people wanting to work with you after you've spent your whole career with with that, I, it's a loss of identity for sure, and a, a loss of that, like self worth. And I can sit here and say, oh well, my self worth shouldn't be tied up in my career, but you know, a big chunk of it is. Just in the same way that if I, you know, lost my husband, I would be devastated for a long time because that is a big part of my life. And my career is as much a part of my life as that. So I think one of the things that I let myself 
do is feel really sad and to admit that I need validation and that my career is that much a part of my life and that is okay and this is painful and that is okay and I can grieve and mourn it and I can feel bad. Did you talk publicly about it or who else did you talk to other than your business partner? Yeah, I was speaking with a number of people at the time. I think in terms of how it affected me really emotionally, I I certainly spoke about it with my business partner. I also spoke about it with my mastermind, (laughs) which has been just a a total lifesaver through this time. I'm sure the Plutus community knows about masterminds, but just in case, every week I meet with a group of fellow business owners who are in the space and we kind of talk through our businesses. But then we also talk about the experience of being a business owner and how that affects our lives and that has really been a life raft for me. And I would say the the positive outcome of this is by having had this time and by going through this enormous process of upheaval, I feel much more clarity around where I want to go now. And I feel much more connected to what values I care about and how they can express themselves in my business moving forward. As now in October, I finally do have some emails in my inbox again, which is nice. <laughs> And what are some of those values that you got more clarity on or connected more with? Yeah. So I think I alluded to this before because this is a pivot I've been working on for a while, but I think the clarity of how I can execute it has become more clear during this time. But values being really about community, really, really interested, not just in talking about things from my own perspective, but really how to loop in as many perspectives as possible and use those to provide unique value in a way that I alone cannot. Another value being creating more what I would say is is meaningful and relevant content. I know that's not like a super clear value, but uh, I think there's a lot of prescriptive content out there in the world and I think it's needed and it's good. It's just that I don't know that there is much else I can say that's going to be super duper valuable in that regard. And so I'm much more interested now in creating content that's much more around, well, how are we presenting that in that prescriptive information? Is there a way to do it better? What are the feelings we're attaching to it? Are those feelings working? And that's really been the genesis of some of the the newer work I've been more working on than publishing. But obviously, my partner Emma and I have released a op-ed recently on CNBC just as an example about, you know, what we would imagine to be a new model for delivering personal finance advice through the framework of empathy and compassion as opposed to shame. And creating that content was really exciting in a way that me just saying like how to save wasn't necessarily exciting anymore. That's great. Are you partnering up with anybody else to create this content or who are you enlisting to help you with this shift? Yeah, I'm always looking for partners. And we have done that with some success thus far. My ambitions, though, are pretty big. So I can't do them alone. With our event, one of the things that's been really wonderful is we've had speakers come in from like a true academic background, like true economists, feminist economists, like I didn't even know that was a thing before. We had the founder of the Sadie Collective, which is about promoting Black women in economics. I I just found there are so many voices out there that I haven't connected to before, even though I have been in this space for so long. And so, you know, part of this idea around community and part of the idea around, I guess what you might call it is thought leadership, is like to really create the kind of change and values that that I want to see in this space, there, there just has to be a better line of communication open between where the bloggers are, the writers are, and then like where the academics are, the researchers are, the economists are, where the financial service providers are. And I've also on the financial services side, you know, I've been having a lot of calls with people from all kinds of companies from the smallest startups to the biggest brokerages to say, you know, they're invested in creating more meaningful products too. So I think how we're connecting the dots between all of these currently siloed groups to create more inclusive, effective, meaningful, urgent, relevant tools and conversations, that's the kind of thing I'm invested in. And yeah, that partnership happens 
in many ways, but hopefully more ways in the future. That is awesome. I love that. I am curious that while you're doing all of this, those contracts are drying up. Luckily, they're coming back, but as they were drying up, what were some of the practical things that you were still doing? Were you still keeping in touch with those contacts? Were you reaching out to new people? What what were some of those things? So after I stopped crying, <laughs> I thankfully had... I did have one project still going and that, and that was a statement event, which I, I do with my partner, Emma Petty. And that wound up being really cool because I then got to devote all of my attention and time to making that as great as I could make it, even though it was digital, which was not what we had planned on. But by spending so much time on refining what that event could look like online, we kind of stumbled upon a new model and kind of loved it. And, <laughs> and we're like, wait a minute, maybe there is value here. And maybe this is now something we can offer to people. And I think that happened with a few things that happened, obviously, with statement event. But from my other work, it happened from the perspective of, oh, I actually know how to do digital, like I know how to do online stuff. Can I take some of these things that used to be a speaking gig and can I pitch a panel around a new study? Can I pitch a discussion around something that's relevant right now because of the pandemic? You know, let's talk about, let's talk about what's happening. And I think I reached back out to some of my past clients and my past contacts to start having a dialogue around what does it look like for them to accept that they're not going to be able to do an in-person event for a year? And maybe because I've now done a digital event, I can help facilitate that. Mm. And so I kind of used my own quote unquote trauma around COVID to, to <laughs> discover, I guess, a new value proposition because, you know, the companies are dealing with that trauma in their own way too. Yeah. I, I was talking to somebody recently. I may have been pitching them. I don't know. <laughs> but I was like, I'm pretty sure South by Southwest is not happening in March, you know, and, and to give somebody the timeline that six months out, basically every conference and event you had thought you were going to actually be able to do next year might not be happening. It's kind of that worst case scenario thing that I was talking about before. Once I accept the worst case scenario, then I can start to think creatively about what I can do instead. But if I'm just kind of like, oh, wait and see, wait and see. Then I'm just constantly stuck in my cycle of grief when it doesn't work out. And it's counterintuitive in a way because it's like, okay, you don't want to accept the worst. But in some ways, it just doing that has really helped me move forward. And then I think when I see companies do that, then or I can talk to companies about it from that perspective, then they're also able to move forward. And I'm able to be the person who's like, okay, well, here's a solution. Yeah, it's almost like... I. I I'm going to use a really formal business term right now, risk mitigation, like you mitigate your risk. And so this is just a very unique arm of that, if you think about it, because like you said, if your business is based on this particular model and that model can no longer be executed, what can you do to shift? I am curious, though, because Statement is a in-person event, or it was last year, this year, it turned virtual. I'm curious, what are your thoughts for next year in 2021 for it? At this point, we are not committing to any in-person events. I think for a number of reasons. One is there's too much uncertainty around what's happening in the world. And we want to err on the side of caution and health. I think secondly is that we have seen this just huge added value by going virtual. We got so many more people there than we ever would have gotten in person. We could make it free because it was lower cost to us. And we had already sponsorship, you know, they stuck with us. So that really made that possible. And then I think third, it facilitated really wonderful conversations because we got speakers we never would have been able to get mm -hmm. if they had to fly in and stay in New York for two days and come speak for an hour. It's such a lesser ask of someone to show up on a, a Zoom for an hour than it is to ask them to speak in a certain place for an hour because of all that extra added time. You're, you're basically paying them for like two days of their life, especially if they have to travel. So I think because of that, we're really leaning into what more we can do digitally and virtually. And I think 
for the foreseeable future, I think that's how we will operate. We love seeing everybody though. So at some point, yes, we definitely want to see everyone in some capacity. But I think uh, in terms of like the real thought leadership work that happens at Statement, it, it's just we're able to get so much more that provide rather so much more value when we do it online because of all those other reasons. Got it. So one last question, Stephanie, is out of all we've talked about, out of everything that you've experienced so far this year, which feels like 300 months, right? (laughs) What would you say has been the biggest lesson that you've learned about yourself and your business? Oh, man, I might need a minute to think about this one. (laughs) That's fine. It's funny because I feel this is probably true for a lot of people listening, but my entire career has been about pivoting and resiliency. I have never had more than two years at a time where I haven't dealt with some kind of paradigm shift. And while I will say that 2020 is unique in a way that I could never have planned for, and just in terms of the scale of the shift, I know I'm resilient. I know I'm adaptable. So I wouldn't say those are new things. I think what I'm really leaning into this time around, though, is that the things that maybe I thought of as flaws or things that I wish were different about myself, they're not flaws. They're who I am. And like I need to build a business and a life around those things rather than trying to like will them away and like spend all my life worrying about that I'm not good at productivity because like listen, I'm just not. And if I can just, or it's spent all my time wishing I didn't care so much about my career and like <laughs> wishing that like my self-worth weren't tied to my work so much, but I, well, it is, it just is. So I think kind of embracing some of those realities about myself and leaning into them is probably the most valuable thing that I've learned during this time. Awesome. Well, Stephanie, where can everyone find you online and your awesome work? Yeah. My main hub is Stephanie O'Connell on Instagram and Twitter and at dot com. And then also I run Statement Event with Emma Petty and Statement Cards is my latest biz baby at Statement Cards on Instagram and at statementcards.com. Well, Stephanie, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Before we catch up with a previous Plutus Awards winner, let's take a look at some lessons we can learn from my conversation with Stephanie. Number one, It's okay to value your work and feel sad about what you lost. Maybe you didn't lose six figures in projected income like Stephanie has. Maybe it's just one client or one project that's been put on hold. Whatever it is, it's okay to grieve that part of your business and to feel what you feel. It is all valid. Lesson number two is to keep planting those seeds once you accept the worst case scenario. So for Stephanie and her husband, they ended up moving out of New York City and she made a couple of other changes. And so it's really not fun to think of these worst case scenarios if you lost income or if you had to pack your bags and move and things like that. But it's all a part of entrepreneurship. It's all a part of life. So once you understand what is the worst that can happen, then you can create some actionable steps to make sure that you're still going to be fine. Lesson number three is to take downtime to get more clarity on your business and ways in which you can ask for support, whether that's joining a new mastermind group, signing up for mentorship, or even sitting down with a cup of tea and journaling all of your desires for your business within the next couple of years. Just because you're not actively working on parts of your business or it's really slow doesn't mean you can't dream. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Now over to Harlan, founder and executive director of the Plutus Foundation. We recently checked up on some of our previous Plutus Awards winners to find out what's been happening since their win. They called in to keep us in the loop. Here's Holly Johnson, Hi there, this is Holly Johnson of clubthrifty.com. I just wanted to give an update since we've won several Plutus Awards over the years. Um, We won Best Frugal Travel Blog twice, and before that, I won Best Freelance Contributor at the Plutus Awards. And let's see, we started our website, Club Thrifty, in 2012. I was able to quit my job and write full-time in 2013, and then my husband was able to quit his job to blog full-time in February of 2015, so 
since we started and since we've gotten involved in the Plutus Awards, uh, we've been working on building our business. We both work at home full time for ourselves and life is pretty good right now. Our website's more travel theme than it used to be. So we travel about 20 weeks of the year and we're just basically raising our kids and living the dream. So there's my update. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Plutus Awards podcast. If you're interested in collaborating with other financial bloggers, podcasters, influencers, and more to chat about your work and ask and answer questions, come join our Facebook community. Search for Plutus Community in the search bar or head to facebook.com slash groups slash Plutus Community. We hope to see you there and get a chance to support you and your amazing work.